Well, good morning, viewers. I'd like to welcome you as part of our um, celebration of this time, the prayer week at the National Week and National um, Week of Prayer and also the Neighborhood Prayer Network. We have with us at this segment um, an interview with um, um, one of the formidable um, people doing amazing work through the um, organization that they lead, and I'm talking about the CSW, that's the Christian Solidarity Worldwide. This morning, um, I have with me um, Mervyn Thomas, and then we're going to be having a, a discussion to just look at how um, and what they are doing and how they are supporting and ensuring that the lives of people are made better than what it is. So this morning, I'd just like to welcome, I'd like you to welcome with me um, Marvin Thomas on this discussion and on this show. Welcome, Mark Marvin. Thank you very much indeed today. Good to be with you. Excellent. Yeah, um, you are the CEO and the founder of C. SW. Um, could you just let us know and let our viewers know what is this organization all about and how did we come, in, come, come across and started this organization? Right, okay, great question. So, um, uh, of course, um, so CSW actually started 41 years ago and we are an advocacy organization. We're a Christian advocacy organization but speaking up for people who are persecuted for their faith. So we, uh, we speak up in all the um, advocacy arenas around the world, in, in, in Westminster, in, in Brussels, um, at the United Nations, in Geneva, at the Human Rights Council, um, in, in Washington, D.C., and in other places. We, um, we provide information to raise awareness of persecution of, of, of Christians mainly, but not just Christians, because um, there are many other religious yeah. minorities later. But we uh, we're not an aid organisation. We don't. Um, we're not a mission organisation. Um, we don't uh, deliver medicines. We don't deliver aid, um, but uh, or or even Bibles. Uh, but we believe it's right to speak up for those being persecuted. And how, how the whole thing came about 40 years ago, 1979, so 41 years ago now, was that um, uh, uh, I was doing a little bit of work in Parliament. I was involved in local politics in Essex and uh, doing a bit of work in Parliament and working for a, uh, a, an MP there uh, who was, was a Catholic and, was, um, and heard, uh, he heard about persecution happening and we're talking about 40 years ago remember so persecution that was happening in eastern europe in those days so the old soviet union and behind the iron curtain russia romania bulgaria and uh, and, and poland and places like that and uh, and we uh, we heard about that persecution and uh, and we decided that we would set up an or, or he decided actually uh, he's no longer with us but uh, that we would um, uh, set up this organization to provide that voice and he asked me to join him and um, actually it was it was quite interesting um, because we are we are first of all we're apolitical so we we work with politicians of all parties um but we're also very much across the board um uh, with regard to christian denominations we as i said we are christian but it was quite interesting because david was um david atkins and the mp involved was a catholic i'm uh, um, and um the the other mp that we got involved right at the beginning was um a guy called the Reverend Martin Smith, who was a, an Ulster Unionist member of Parliament, who at the time was the Grand Master of the World Orange Order. So we had extreme Protestantism, we had Catholicism, we had um, uh, Pentecostals, uh, which was fantastic. Uh, and the very fact, I guess, that we are still in existence shows that we never talked about theology. Um, I think <laughs> if we had a done, we wouldn't have got very far. But, um, but, you know, we were united in a passion to speak up for those unable to speak for themselves. And, and, and that's what uh, we have done all of these years. And, um, uh, you know, when, when we started 
speaking out for uh, Christians in Eastern Europe. And, and it was only Christians in Eastern Europe in those days, because that was the only information anybody had. And, um, but nobody, nobody was, certainly nobody politically was taking much notice of this. Whereas today, and we can talk about that perhaps as we go along today, there is more political awareness of religious persecution than there has ever been. So that's the kind of journey we're on, we've, we've been on, Tunde. Good. I mean, it's, it's really exciting to hear your very uh, broad and eloquent uh, referral to how you started off. And I'm, I'm quite excited to see and to hear that you started off right in the heart of our political uh, operation here in the United Kingdom in Westminster. And um, also, and, and it, it, it baffles me when I look at the fact that he actually started right in the heart of Westminster. However, um, I, I'm not sure. Will you think there is there is a recognition of the Christian faith and the advocacy by Christian faith for what the for how we deal with the marginalised in the in our community now, either locally or um, nationally or in the in the in the international scene? Do you think we have more of such advocacy happening now than before, or we had it more before than what we're having now? No, I think I think uh, there is more. In, in my view, there's more advocacy happening than than there was when we started out on this road. And in fact, um, I was I, I was having dinner with a friend last night, and 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 we uh, I was ruminating over the fact that actually the word advocacy wasn't used wasn't actually being used much in those days mm -hmm. um and of course advocacy does mean different things to different people oh, uh nice. but um but no um i think the whole advocacy field um not just christians and i think christians were late on the scene to be honest with you um when i go back 40 years and uh, and my involvement in politics as a christian as a pentecostal christian was actually frowned upon oh. um you know we um <clears throat> we were to, i was brought up to believe that um uh, you know our only role in the world was to go out and preach the gospel and the only way to do that was to knock on people's doors or to uh, have open air uh, open air meetings and all of those things that that we do as christians and did uh, but actually getting involved in in the political world as a, as a Christian voice um, was actually frowned upon in lots of areas and it was it was not until um, yeah I, I guess it was a similar time that I started people like Lyndon Bowring of, of care started speaking up and of course you had Mary Whitehouse from the National Viewers and Listeners Association and the, and the great festivals of light they were that was new ground for evangelicals. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I think, I, 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 and it took a long while yeah. for evangelicals to actually realize that they had a voice and that they should use the voice. Before, politics was a dirty game and people didn't realize that it will remain dirty unless we brought salt and light to it so so yeah i think it was an, and we were overtaken by many other very effective um, yeah. advocacy groups uh, like particularly in the lgbt area and and the and greenpeace and people like that who were making big inroads so it took us a long while but but now there is a lot of it happening uh, um, I, I think, too, um, it's true to say, and I've been around Parliament for all these years, I think there are more um, evangelical, um, committed, practising Christians in Parliament than I can ever remember. And, uh, and they are uh, providing a voice for a whole range of issues, not just for religious freedom. Good. Fantastic. Um... I mean, undoubtedly, uh, I agree with you that uh, evangelical and Pentecostal, we came late onto the picture. And, and isn't it an irony that Jesus actually um, did advocacy more than we can ever imagine because he spoke for the oppressed. He was out there, he brought the message, um, he reached out to the people and gave welfare to them, but he also proceeded 
to the next stage by advocating for them, speaking for them, becoming their voice. Now, in your, in your example, and, and I really want to salute the good work that you do all over the world, but your example, are there two main, um, two main um, advocacy work that you have been involved in that you have championed over the years for 40 years that has come out um, elaborately well received and successful in your own in your own um, um, appraisal. Yeah, I mean that's a, that's a great they're great questions and, and and of course advocacy is a very or success of advocacy is a very very different difficult thing to measure, um, and and we we don't get so what we do in CSW is we will. Um, we, we do two things. We, we try to, um, if, if we hear of prisoners in prison, and this is how we started in Eastern Europe, it was all about campaigning for individual prisoners of, of conscience. Mm. And uh, so um, when you pray and when you campaign and when you get uh, supporters to write letters to their member of parliament to put pressure on, et cetera, et cetera. And when that person is released from prison, that you can chalk up as a success. That is an immediate success. But that, in my view, is just first aid. It's putting, it's putting a bandage on. It's, it's not dealing with the problem. We, what we want to see is nobody put in prison at all for their faith. Nobody killed or tortured or, or attacked because of their faith. And so, so actually getting countries to respect freedom of religion or belief that is the big overarching goal and uh, but it, it starts with uh, raising awareness and so so our successes you talk about big successes i can name you a number of prisoners that we've campaigned for over the year that have been freed but i'd rather talk about um countries that are moving in the right direction with regard to the respect for religious freedom and successes in that field are very often small successes. One of the, uh, you talk about, um, you know, can I look at particular cases? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to look at a country, North Korea, and um, uh, I, I, I can't remember how many years ago now, but maybe, maybe 10 to 15 years ago, um, uh, nobody was actually talking about human rights abuses in North Korea. This is a relatively new thing. And one of my staff came back from, um, from South Korea and, and told me about uh, all she had heard from, from one or two different witnesses about horrific things that were going on, particularly to Christians in that nation. And she asked me if she could write a report on this. And she did write a report called North Korea a case to answer and a call to act. And, uh, and that was the first, and it was a, a, a thick report and CSW deals with very, very careful research. We yes. always get everything checked out from two or three different sources. Mm -hmm. And, but this report was the beginning of the world knowing about the persecution, uh, particularly of Christians in North Korea. And then we had to work out, so it was, um, a case to answer, but a call to act. So mm. all that we do, we want to recommend what actions should be taken. And, uh, and kind of long story short, one of the big things that we campaigned for for a long while was for the um, United Nations, uh, where we have status as an organisation, United Nations, we wanted them to carry out a, 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 a commission of inquiry and that was carried out, I, I believe it was 2014, um, by the United Nations. And, and uh, uh, the, uh, the person who chaired that, an Australian judge, um, he came to the conclusion, and he took evidence from lots of different places, um, he came to the conclusion that there was no parallel on earth to North Korea in the way that it, um, in its human rights abuses, but particularly in its treatment of Christians. That was a huge step to get that report done, but it wasn't ultimate success because just look at North Korea today. Um, you know, it's still carrying out those persecutions, but we, we, you know, so what our job now is to make sure that that report 
just doesn't gather dust mm -hmm. and uh, and nothing happens we are campaigning to get the united nations to actually take action and there's a so that so there are many things that you can take but north korea i believe for us was one of the landmark successes in writing that report and now there are many organizations and people looking at human rights in north korea so i see that as a success but one of the other areas you talk about two and uh <laughs> well, i mean that would be good because uh, yeah it, it, it's, it's yeah nice. well yeah. yeah i mean this is a much almost a much bigger one in oh. that um uh, as i mentioned when we started we started campaigning for christians in eastern europe so very specific area very specific group of people yeah. and um of course 10 years after we started communism collapsed throughout europe and uh, and 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 many people came to us and said oh well there's no need for your organization anymore because you know christians and and, and christians lives did change in those countries although um, things are going backwards in some of them now, but I believe two things. I mean, one, I believe that the reason that um, uh, that communism fell, what, one of the reasons, and one of the key reasons, was that Christians around the world were praying uh, for for Eastern Europe and were praying for Christians to be freed. And and the power of prayer today is the number one thing that yeah. we believe in in our organisation. That is an advocacy tool in itself. And, uh, and so um, I believe that was one of the reasons that communism fell. But what did that lead to for us as an organization? It led to us having to look elsewhere in the world to see, um, uh, to see if there was other persons. We didn't even know if there was other persecution. And of course, we realized that there was, sadly, there was an awful lot of persecution. In fact, uh, the latest statistics show that 79% of the world's population live in countries with high or very high restrictions on religious freedom, which is staggering. Yeah. And that's not just Christians, that's people of other faiths too that are, are persecuted. And so as we looked around, we, um, we saw that there was, there was a lot more persecution. And, uh, and so we started speaking out on other countries. One of the countries we were speaking out on uh, was Burma and, uh, and many Christian groups being persecuted in Burma or Myanmar. Yeah. And, um, and uh, uh, while, we were, while we were speaking up for uh, different Christian groups, the, the, the Karen and the Kareni and the Chin and the Kachin, we came across a Muslim group called the Rohingyas, uh, which of course everybody has heard of today. They hadn't, no, the world didn't know about the Rohingyas then. And we were, we were posed with a dilemma today. Mm. We were Christians. Um, how could we speak up for uh, Muslims? Uh, was that the right thing to do? Um, of, course it, of course it was the right thing to do. Uh, and we did it. But we were kind of, we kind of did it secretly. We didn't, uh, I was, I was not too keen on telling our supporters, our, our evangelical Christian supporters, because I thought that they might misunderstand it. Um, but so over the years, we've really looked into the theology of this thing. And to me, this is one of the greatest achievements that we've done in CSW is that we, um, we now believe and wholeheartedly and our supporters do too um and incidentally i've never had any pushback from those people that i was frightened of telling this about in the first place uh because you know um two two or three things one is god um we are all made in the image of god whether we are a christian a muslim a jew or or or, or an atheist um, we're all made in the image of God and God gave every one of us a free will to choose. Yeah. Uh, we are, we can't compel people to be Christians. Um, and, and it's not right to do that. And, um, so God gave us a free will uh, and God is a God of justice. Proverbs 31 said, tells us that we are to speak up for those unable to speak for themselves. It doesn't say, 
speak up for God's covenant people or speak up for Christians or it says speak up for those unable and that includes the Rohingya Muslims it includes those uh, between one and three million Uyghur Muslims in China that are in re-education yes it includes Hindu girls in in um, in Pakistan who are being married off to to, to Muslim um, uh, um, husbands. It includes uh, people of all faiths, and by speaking and, and of course um, we are told there are many scriptures. Uh, I haven't got time to go through them. Of course, Leviticus talks a lot about looking after the alien um, and the foreigner, and these are people that are not the same as us. It talks about, um, of course, the great example is Jesus' uh, story of the Good Samaritan, uh, which says, well, who is my neighbour? Well, and he didn't get the answer that he hoped for, because he was hoping he was going to be able to tick off three or four people that were his neighbour. But Jesus said, everyone is your neighbour. The whole world is your neighbour. Yeah. And particularly those uh, that we, we don't agree with. So, Tunde, I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to God the Father. Let's get that credential out of the way. Um, I, I'm not a syncretist. I don't believe that all faiths lead to God. I believe there is only one way. But, I, but by speaking up for the Rohingya Muslims or, or the Hindu girls in Pakistan or the Baha'is in Iran, um, by doing that, I am doing what Jesus would do. And, uh, and, and why do I do that? I do it because I'm a Christian and it's a very powerful thing to do. Yeah. I, I think, I think um, you will certainly have been um, such an exciting um, um, person to, to, to hear about all the things that you do with your team at CSW. And, um, and I, I quite like the way you put it, that um, you got involved by making a case to answer and a call to act for people to start something. Uh, and, and foundations are very important. What, what you have said extensively is how you go about laying the foundation of the, 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 the change that will happen in the lives of so many people all around the world, starting from, from Europe, when, where, where you started. Now, can, can I just see that with all these successes that you, we can highlight, that we can see, or that you have been experiencing, where do you see CSW in five years' time? What, what is that main thing that you're looking at that will be your targeted, targeted goal um, for, for, for your organization? Well, our, our vision is to see a world free from religious persecution. But I, but I also recognize if you start questioning me on that, I'm gonna struggle to tell you whether that's ever going to happen. Mm. But just because, um, just because it is an almost unachievable goal doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't strive for that. And, uh, and so, you know, that's what we want to see. We want to see in five years time, in 10 years, you know, one of the things we, I, I don't like you giving me five years because um, uh, that's too short a time. Okay. You know, um, we, we all look at one of the great heroes of all of us in this kind of work is, is William Wilberforce. Yes. We forget it took him 40 years to do what he did. We also yes. forget that he didn't do it alone. He did it with groups of, of, of other people. He did, it, he did it through advocacy. He did it through raising awareness. But it took a long while. And the thing is, today, today we live in a world with instant answers if you want to know the answer to anything what do we do we get on our phones and we tap in um, and look on the internet and we've got the answer we i email you and i get a, if i don't get a reply in a couple of hours i'm thinking where's he gone to he must be asleep mm -hmm. uh, you know we want instant answers instant success and the generation that's growing up today um uh, is growing up with that but yeah. we have to be much more, we have to recognize that things take a long while. So when I look back over the last 40 years, and, and, I, and I said to you right at the beginning that, that nobody was talking about these issues, particularly in the political. Today, there is, um, right as I speak now, there is a, a worldwide, it's called the International Religious Freedom Alliance, and it is made up of 30 countries. Uh, who uh, led by Ambassador Sam Brownback, who is the American ambassador for 
international religious freedom. These countries, and we are a member of that, Britain is a member, these are countries that are working uh, to bring about change for international religious freedom. I, I, was, at a, I was at a ministerial conference in, um, in Washington last year, which Tony Blair spoke at. Mm. And our former prime minister said this, he said, if I was, if I was in power today, um, if I was in political power today, religious freedom or freedom of religion or belief would be of the highest order in my foreign policy, in my foreign policy. He said, he said it would be, it used to be way down the list. He said, but today it will be of the highest order because what people don't realise is that religion, because I guess because in this country and in Western Europe generally, we are we are not a, we are not Christian nations anymore. We have a Christian heritage, uh, but 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 most people in the West don't realise that religion, whatever religion it is, impacts the lives of most people in the world. Most people are religious in one form or another. And so to have religious freedom, the countries that have religious freedom are countries normally that have economic stability. They have um, social cohesion. They, they, they're, they're countries that are good to live in. And so we need to recognize that. And to hear someone like Tony Blair say, it would be up there of the highest order. That to me is one of the greatest successes that an organization like CSW could have. We've been speaking out about this for years and it's beginning to happen. But let me say a big but, and the but is, although there is this awareness amongst that nations, we are still yet to see wholesale change on the ground in countries uh, like North Korea, in countries like China, in countries like India, countries like Nigeria. We are, we are not seeing change on the ground. That is the next step, but we are moving step by step. And so in five years time, I'd like to see some of those countries that I've just mentioned, just move a small way towards granting religious freedom for their citizens. And I'd like to see the world taking bigger steps. I'd like to, what I would like to see today is, is, is um, the media taking this thing up, the secular media. Um, I, I believe they're quite a key to this because it's, um, you know, we, we don't hear much about religious persecution in the media. It's beginning to get more of a profile, uh, but we need, uh, we need those, uh, you know, perhaps we, what we need maybe is one of those iconic pictures that grabs the world's attention yeah. and says, we must do something about this. So uh, I want to see more media awareness. I want to see change happening in countries. That's what I'd like to see in five years time. But I recognize that time is, is, um, is well. short. I, I know five years is short, and, but I also know that um, in a journey of, of 40 years, of 100 years, it starts with one step. And I quite, like, I quite like the way you highlighted it, that is a step-by-step -step growth. And um, if, if one is going to look at it, look, I mean, trying to put in perspective what you do all over the world is like, I mean, the best image to describe it is when you see a fire engulfing um, a particular building, let's say like the, the, the Twin Tower in America, fire engulfing it. While, while people were running out of the building, you see the, 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 the firemen run into the building. So if I look at it with what you do, you look at situations where there are, there are heated injustices and cases of of um, mass abuse of power in political area, in religious area, and so on and so forth. And you dive into it um, directly to help those who are caught up in it. Now, that could be that could be highlighted as a very dangerous thing to do. Dangerous for those of you who are doing it, but also dangerous for the people you are trying to protect. Because if the oppress, uh, most of the people who are oppressing them, who are trying to sideline them, they are usually very powerful people who you need to know what you are, what you, what you are using to, to, to come again. So in, in a very small way, what do you think Christians need to do or why should they pray for you or do, do, is there things that you, you think Christians can do on the sideline to support what CSW is doing all over the world? Uh, 
absolutely um we can't do this without the support of uh, of christians everywhere and um although i have a superbly we have a superbly talented team at csw we need christians everywhere actually the first thing we need christians to do is to wake up uh, and to and to actually uh, be aware of what is happening and when i go and speak in churches or when i used to go and speak in churches before the lockdown um when i go and speak in churches the the one thing that i hear time after time is people saying to me we had no idea this was happening uh and 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 they're shocked by some of the stories that i tell them uh and um and so they but but very often if i'm honest my guess is that two or three weeks after i've been at their church and shocked them they've forgotten all of what i said um because they've got back into their own so wake up apathy is the one of the biggest problems in the western church wake wake up to what's happening to our brothers and sisters around the world and and recognize that that there are there are i i, I tell you there are three things that we need to do uh, that i would like christians listening or watching this to do one is pray because prayer changes things we all believe that prayer is and when i go and visit um christians who are under attack in northern nigeria when i go and visit christians in secret in places like china uh, and, and and iraq and, and and others the first thing that when i say what can we do for you the first thing they always say is pray for us and so so christians everywhere we would love to be praying about this but it's not enough to and, and please don't get me wrong prayer <laughs> prayer is really key but but we need to do more than pray we also need to act we need to speak up and i quoted that scripture from proverbs 31 earlier speak up for those unable to speak for themselves so how do we do that christians don't know necessarily how they can do that well um there's lots of resources and i'll tell you at the end our, our website and so forth there are lots of resources that we have where christians can write to their members of parliament maybe they can and we make it very easy these days because you can do it all by not going away from your computer you can do it on email um send emails to presidents of nations and ambassadors speak up because you know when we don't speak up we are complicit in the in in what's happening and that's really important to um, uh, to, to say and, and 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 also especially when we don't speak up for other faith groups that's really really important i'd like to i'd like to read you a little tiny extract from a uh, from a book that was um uh, that was written by a pastor erwin lutzer and he was a young man as a boy he was in nazi germany and and this is what he writes he, he says a railroad track ran behind our small church and each sunday morning we could hear the whistle in the distance and then the wheels coming over the tracks we became disturbed when we heard the cries coming from the train as it passed by yeah. we realized that it was carrying jews like cattle in the cars week after week the whistle would blow we dreaded to hear the sound of those wheels because we knew that we would hear the cries of the Jews en route to death camp. Their screams tormented us. We knew the time the train was coming and when we heard the whistle blow, we began to sing hymns. Mm. By the time the train came past our church, we were singing at the tops of our voices. If we heard the screams, we simply sang more loudly and Soon we heard the screams no more. Although years have passed, I still hear the train whistle in my sleep. God forgive me. God forgive all those of us who called ourselves Christians and yet did nothing to intervene. Wow. Today we, we talk and about, I hear so often, and uh, remember my son when he was at school coming home and saying his teacher had said, talked about the Holocaust and said, this will never happen again. It is happening. Genocide is happening against religious groups, against Christians and Yazidis, for example, in in in, uh, in Iraq and many other places. People begin are beginning to think that genocide may be happening in in central belt of Nigeria at the moment. I mean, these things are happening, 
are we going to just sing at the tops of our voices and ignore them? Or are we going to stand up and speak out? That's what I want people watching this today to do, is to stand up and speak out. And the third thing we can do, uh, very briefly, is we can... Uh, CSW uh, produces uh, an address book, actually. It's called Connect and Encourage, where we ask Christians to do something very simple, to send letters and cards of encouragement to people who are going through persecution. Mm. And uh, as I say, it's an address book. It tells you addresses. You can write. It ta- How long does it take to write a simple card saying, we're praying for you? We're thinking for you. We're, we're speaking about you. We are raising awareness. So there are three things that people can do. And, uh, and, and if we don't do it, if we don't speak up, then we are complicit in what's going on, I'm sorry to say. Um, I, I think that, 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 that little passage that you just read in that book is, is really engrafting and very, very strong in carrying your message across. I hear you say, wake up, Christians. I hear you say, speak up. And I hear you say, connect and also encourage those who are caught up in this very um, dilemma. Now, the, the, of course, whatsoever thing that you are doing, and um, it's like any other person doing any good thing there. Um, has COVID affected what you're doing at all? I hear you say earlier on that when you used to preach. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm still doing it, but I'm doing it by this Zoom business, which course, is... Uh, <laughs> so so <laughs> what, what impact has COVID-19 had on your operation um, since it started? And um, is, is there any threat to what you... If, if there's one, a number one threat to what you're doing, what would that number one threat be? Well, actually, it would be the threat that I've just talked about, and that is apathy amongst the apathy. church. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, um, but no, COVID, yes, of course, COVID has affected us all. Um, what, what has happened, um, two things. One is um, COVID has, uh, there are many governments around the world who are using COVID as an excuse to repress mm. religious minorities even more than they are doing at the moment. And, uh, and in some countries where aid is being withheld from religious minorities uh, simply because they are so so covid as as and, and of course also pre- uh, people that are in idp camps people that are christians and, and other faith groups that and uh, that are in prison in in terrible conditions in places like iran in these re-education camps in china where COVID can spread so quickly. So that is a threat in itself. But the way that we operate, yes, you're right. I, I don't go out and speak at churches at the moment. Um, so I'm not able to get this message across. But having said that, um, I've fed, we've, we've done a number of um, webinars and virtual where we've actually got more people very often together than we would have normally. We, are, we have our advocacy meetings. I, I'm a member of the Foreign Secretary's Human Rights Advisory Group. And, you know, on this very screen I'm looking at now, I had the Foreign Secretary a few weeks ago where we were talking about the issues of religious freedom. Mm. And, uh, and so, and yesterday I chaired a, uh, a worldwide webinar with um, nearly 90 people from over 20 countries uh, coming together to talk about Nigeria. It's very easy to convene that. It, it wouldn't have been easy to do that uh, uh, pre-Zoom, if you like. Yeah. Um, so, so in some ways it's made things easier. In some ways it made things more difficult. One of the things that, that I find hard is that one of the key parts of our work is to, when we go to countries, to what we call our solidarity work is to go in to go into a family whose husband is in prison to go into a family uh, where one of their members has been uh, uh, has been killed and to put our arms around them and to pray with them we can't do that at the moment we can do it virtually but it's not the same and uh, so there, there are ways that, that, that certainly have impacted some good some bad yeah. All right. Um, I, I, I think we, we have really covered a lot this, in this discussion. And um, before we draw um, to a close, I want to be able to ask you, if there's somebody 
a Christian or even not a Christian who's heard this interview today, who's saying, oh, I like the sound of this. I like the sound of what I'm hearing. And they want to practically engage with CSW. W what should they do? What steps should they take to, to engage with you and begin to make some practical steps about wanting to do something along what you're doing? Okay. Well, the first thing they should do is visit our website, which is um, csw.org.uk. And on there, they will, if they explore that, they'll find all kinds of ways that they can help. Um, one very practical way, as I talked about writing letters and cards, but we would, we, uh, we would love Christians to invite us to their church once lockdown's over, or even invite us to their virtual church, because, as I said, um, what we must overcome is apathy. Um, you know, uh, there is there is a young girl in Nigeria at the moment. She was 14 years old when she was kidnapped. Her name's Leah Sharibu. You've probably heard of her. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she was only not. All of her school friends were released. They were Muslims. She was the only Christian. She yeah. was told she could be released if um, if, if she converted to oh, Islam. Yeah. She refused to do that when she was 14 years old. She's still being held. So we want churches to be aware of those kind of stories. So we would love people who are watching this now, please invite us to come and speak at your church. Please consider we have ambassadors in churches, people that will. So every week today we produce on a Saturday morning, we send out by email a prayer email with the latest news for people to pray about and we ask um, for a representative in a church an ambassador we call them or it, it, you know if you're if you're a minister who's watching this now um subscribe to that email and and make it a uh, make it a um a regular thing to pray on sundays in church for those being persecuted um, that's a tremendous first step to take but please visit our website csw.org.uk and you'll find many other things that you can do too excellent now the, the last question which i enjoy asking when, when i do this kind of interview is that personally i believe that young people we call we usually call them the millennials they are the most powerful force on earth now, practically, I believe, because um, if you want to get something to fly, get into the hands of, of the millennials. Now, what role do they have in your organization? Uh, they, uh, do they have a strong role or they, they are, wh what is it that they, they can do? Because they are out there and they're thinking, how can I just be involved in it? They can go to the website, of course. They can, they can, they can, they can, they can want to be part of this. But what else can they do, the, the millennials in our generation? Well, they can do all of the things that I've just talked about. And, and, and you know, you're absolutely right, the millennial. But, but, but the, what's, what they're now calling, um, I think it's called either iGen or Generation Z. <laughs> I prefer to say Generation Z, but there you go. Um, yeah. But actually, my son is one of those. He was born in 2000. He's at university now. Yes. And, and, and you're right. These people are, that, that particular generation that were born after 2000 are, they're much less likely, and I'm talking about not Christians, are much less likely to be into drink and drugs and those things, and they're much more likely to be into justice issues. Okay. So what a tremendous opportunity uh, for us and, and for students. And we, we would love, you know, I have to say um, that um, uh, it's, it's, most of our supporters are older and they're not the young. We, we really want to, I'm so glad you've asked this question because we really need to reach those people. We need to harness that energy, that passion, uh, that, that, you know, we need to get them on board and to be saying to all of their friends, whether they're Christians or not, what's going on here is unjust. Mm. And, uh, and so we would love if there are, if there are, uh, if there are young people watching this, please do contact us. We, we are trying to more and more move into the 18 to 30 age group, uh, mm -hmm. more and more into students. Um, we do some work with a student group called Just Love, which mm -hmm. is a tremendous organisation working on university campus that are into justice issues, Christians that are into justice issues. So, yeah, uh, please, I hope there are young people listening to this. If they are, 
please contact us and say what can I do and we will uh, we want to set up groups of millennial as you call them and, and, and to say do something because because it's actually you know it's your generation I believe it's really going to make a difference as we go wow. forward Excellent. but don't expect it to happen overnight as I go no. back to before we're no. not instant on our phones yeah it's it's going to take time be patient mm. but but be steadfast yeah wow um, I must say this this has been an exciting time just sitting down listening to you the passion is there the grace is there and the wealth of examples and the good work that you're doing all over the world i want to salute your team um, all across in here in the uk and all across the world what you do and um i want to also believe that god almighty will continue to strengthen you and also will empower you and will open new doors and op also send new helping hands into your organization in the mighty name of Jesus. Is that, is, is that okay if I just say a prayer um, as we Please. close on this, on this um, session? Please, Tunde. And, and, and can I just say too, yes, uh, once this lockdown's over, I should look forward to be invited to your church to speak I will, I will be the one, I will be the first to, 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 to send an invitation <laughs> to you. And we'll be looking forward to having you in Axbridge um, to come and be part of our, of, our, of, our, of our celebration. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh Lord, we are so grateful for this amazing, amazing ministry, amazing organization, and the enormous work that they do all over the work. They have fulfilled scriptures, and they are fulfilling scriptures being voiced to the voiceless. The same thing that Jesus did while he was here, here on earth. Father God, I pray for Mervyn Thomas today and all of their team at the sea. SW, and we ask oh God, that the new grace of God will be released upon them, even in this time of lockdown, in this time of pandemic, so that they will be renewed with new passion, new grace, and envy God, oh God with, the, with the joy of taking the ministry of speaking for the voiceless unto another level in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray for all the countries that they are represented in and are doing this work. <clears throat> Father, we pray, oh God, that you will send them help, help that will lift up their hands in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray especially that you will bring, oh God, an influx, oh God, of young people, people with passion, people with mm -hmm. grace, people, oh God, with daring boldness and confidence that will be able to challenge the status quo and lift up the banner and, of the name of Jesus and also speak for other, other faiths, oh God, who are repressed in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray, oh God, that freedom and liberty will become an extension through the hand of this organization to the lives of so many people. Father God, I pray that you bless um, Marvin Thomas and his whole team Bless them in their personal lives, oh God. Bring, oh God, resources needed for them to do their work efficiently and more, more effectively in the mighty name of Jesus. Father God, we thank you. We bless you, oh God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen.